Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna be solving example 2.2, which is the force on a submerged inclined surface. So what that means is basically if you had a surface that was submerged under, for example, in a tank of water, then we're gonna figure out what the force acting on that surface is that results from the fluid or the water. In this case, inclined just means it's at an angle. And you know, in practical situations, there's lots of cases where we might wanna do this for you know, gates or panels that we might have on, on large tanks that hold fluids to make sure the material's okay, to make sure that we can seal it okay. And this is the first example that follows from video five related to uh, section 2.3, which is hydrostatic force on submerged surfaces. So I've separated out this video, but it is really part of that uh, section 2.3. And this is part of the fluid statics section. So that's why we call it a hydrostatic force, right? And um, means in the fluid in this tank would be a stationary, right? So it's not flowing around. And uh, let's get right into it here. Okay, so let's first solve this using the first method above. So that's also the integral method. Okay, and in this question, we have an inclined surface with a fluid reservoir. There's a hinged edge at point A. It says the plate's five meters wide, and they want us to determine the resultant force, FR, of the water and the air on the inclined plate. So we read out our governing equations. And right off the bat, we can simplify this one because there's an ambient pressure acting on the backside of this surface as well. We just cancel that off right from the start. Okay, and then we write the others. Okay, I'll sketch out the geometry so we get our coordinate axes correct. And those are the same coordinates we used in the examples above. So that means that H is Y sine 30. And we'll write out explicitly what DA is here. And I'll simplify it this way because we're not going to have any change of the force in the X direction since the pressures only change with depth. And in this case, there's no change of depth in the X direction. So then we can just convert from now on our DA integrals into these dy integrals. And for more detail on that, you can refer back to when that was done in your calculus classes. Okay, so now we just sub in, start solving the resultant force. So we sub in for pressure and dA. And now the integration limits in the y direction will be from the beginning to the end of the plate here. So we'll label that. Okay, so I'll label this figure down here and then we'll complete that integration. All right, then we just figure out what L1 and L2 are, and I'll do that up here on the figure in green. Now we sub in for all these values. So that's the density of water. So that's our answer. And once again, we see just how important it is to keep those units throughout so we know what units the final answer is in. So we've got now the magnitude and direction of the resultant force, and all that's left to calculate is the location. Now this calculation is very similar to the one above it, so what I'm going to do is write it out here without narration so you can follow all the steps.
Now we can calculate the x direction just by thinking this through actually and save ourselves a lot of work. So because we don't have any more or less pressure acting on either side of the plate in the x direction, we know that the force will just be acting at the center of the plate. So we can actually just write that out here. And when we solve using the second method, I'll go into this location in a bit more depth because we're really going to want to take a look at it with respect to where the centroid is located. Okay, so now I'm going to solve it again using the second method, and then we'll do a quick comparison of the two methods uh, after I'm finished that. So we begin with our governing equation for method two here to calculate the resultant force. And we remember that P sub C is the gauge pressure at the centroid location. And again, that's gauge pressure because we have the atmospheric pressure that's acting on the back side of the plate. So we sub in for that centroid pressure. Okay, now H sub C is the height at the centroid location. So our first question is, where is the centroid located on this rectangular surface? So we'll look at our table here to figure out where the centroid location is. So we see the rectangle that's given here, and it says the origin of axis is located at the centroid in this table. So we can take that y bar value. So C is the centroid, and then the y coordinate is this coordinate here which is given as h over 2, so in the middle of the plate. Okay, so now we have to correlate that back to our problem that we're solving. So what I'm going to do is label the figures here so we make sure we get the centroid height correct. All right, now let's go ahead and sub in. So the green line is in the y direction there, and the length of that line is just the L1 distance. And then we have to go halfway along the plate to get to the centroid. So that distance is just the L2 minus L1 divided by 2. But we're not looking for the y coordinate at the centroid here. We're looking for the height at the centroid, so h sub c. So what we'll do to get that side of the triangle is to just take the y coordinate and we multiply it by the sine 30 degrees there. Now we just sub in for the area which is just the uh, length times the width for this rectangle. Now I'm just going to multiply all these out and simplify this expression. Now we just group and cancel. At this point, we have the exact same expression that we arrived at using method one. So I'll just stop here and write that it's the same as method one, and we'll move on and solve the rest of the problem. OK, so that's given us the magnitude of the resultant force. We know the direction is normal to the surface because the pressure forces always act in the normal direction in the hydrostatic problems. Now we need the location. So we're going to use the governing equation for method two here, and I'll solve that out. So that's our governing equation, because I'm using the one where we have the same p naught force acting on the backside. So we have atmospheric pressure that cancels us off, and we can use the gauge pressure. So that's our governing equation there. And the reason we use this method is because these are commonly used terms, and they're usually tabulated, as we mentioned. So we'll be referring to this table up there, and I'll go ahead and sub in for these terms now. Now for the i x hat x hat term, as I mentioned, tables often write this a little bit differently. So it's really important that we solve enough of these questions, we remember what we learned in statics, so that we know how to pick the term from this table. So what this table has there as ix, that's what they list as our second moment of area 
about the x-axis. So we can go ahead and sub that in. Where our b will substitute for our width and our h is our length. Okay, now we sub all that in. And of course we get the same answer that we got when we solved with method one, 6.22 meters. Now there's an interesting comparison we can make here. So let's examine this for a second and just see if we have the correct answer. So we're predicting that the location that this force acts, its Y coordinate is at 6.22 meters. So let's compare that against the centroid location, which is at six meters. So this is saying that the force is acting a little bit below the centroid location. So I'm gonna scroll up here and label that on our drawing, and then we'll take a moment to reflect on that. Okay, so I label the resultant force there. I draw it normal to the plate because the pressure forces always act normal to the plate. And I've shown it a little bit below the centroid location. So we think for a second, is that what we would expect? Does that make sense to us? And if we look at this figure on the right here, we look at the pressure distribution, we see that because the pressure increases the deeper you go down through the fluid, there's actually more force pushing at the lower end of the plate than at the top end of the plate. So this arrow at the bottom is shown as longer than the arrow at the top. And what that means is, when you look at the force that's pressing on this plate, more of the force pushes towards the bottom of the plate, so that shifts the resultant force from the centroid location below, below the centroid location. So this will be important when you answer these questions on exams. We'll give a lot of marks to make sure that you understand that you can think through these problems. So you know, for example, that that resultant force must be acting below the centroid because the forces are larger, deeper down in the fluid. So they push a little more strongly towards the bottom of the plate. Okay, now we solve for the X location. Again, we can think this one through. And when you look at the rectangle in the x direction, there is no variation of pressure along the x direction. So we would expect it to be in the middle of the plate the same way we did for method one. However, if you wanted to sub in and we can check the numbers, we can do that quickly as well, just as a back check. So we go back to our table to find these values. X coordinate of the centroid is just half of the width. And the IXY is zero. So we go sub that in. And no surprise, we get the same answer that we had before. It's in the middle of the plate. And let's do just a quick analysis on method one versus method two. So I think we can see from method two that this can be a shorter and quicker way to solve the problem, but it's really important you know how to read those tables and you understand exactly what the second moment of area is referring to because it would be easy to mix that up. So if you're not reading the table correctly, you don't sub in correctly, your answer could be way off. So method two is certainly the quicker way to go if you can read those tables. Whereas method one, which is the method I tend to prefer. Yes, you need to solve an integral, and yes, it can take a little bit longer, but you're not relying on reading the table correctly. You can integrate anything, and these tend to be fairly simple integrals to solve, and then you don't have to worry about whether or not you're reading the table correctly. So method one, a little bit longer, but it's a little more foolproof because you don't have to read the table. Method two can be quicker to solve, but you just gotta make sure you can read the tables correctly. Okay, so a rectangle is the easiest shape to solve. Now in the examples that follow this one, which will come uh, again in, in the next two videos, which are separate from this video, uh, in those we're gonna do some more complex shapes to see how the force can be calculated in a scenario where the shapes are a little more complicated.